Hey, and welcome back to the Urban Monk Podcast. This is Dr. Pedram Shojai here to hang out with one of my best friends in the world, Abel James. You've probably seen his name, his face, or heard his voice, which is very distinct, all over uh, iTunes and uh, YouTube. He's one of the top podcasters out there, and he's just, man, he's a righteous dude doing the right thing, moved out to the sticks to just insulate, and at the same time is moving mountains and changing the world. We cover all kinds of topics from what the bad guys are doing to interrupt what the good guys are doing, all the way to how to increase your own kind of personal signature and get out there in the world in this free internet environment and kind of cut out the middlemen. So we go all over the place. This is how he and I talk offline and we kind of brought it online. I hope you enjoy it. I, I love hanging out with this guy and I think you're gonna love this show. Uh, here we go. You, dude, you moved to Wilder in the Smoky Mountains. How long have you been there? We've been here since uh, June, so a couple months now. It's absolutely fantastic. There's nobody here. <laughs> Love it. So, so you took a year off and traveled the country and then landed in the Smoky Mountains away from everything. Yeah. It, well, you know, it's one of the most depressing things about traveling uh, America, especially these days, is that, um, well, actually, what, one of my friends, Denny, who you've met as well, Pedram, who plays with the Tim McGraw band, he tours all around. He lives in Hawaii for a long time. And whenever anyone meets him, they're just like, wow, that must have been amazing. What's it like to live in, in Hawaii and, and travel to all these places? And he's just like, well, you know, every place is kind of like every other place. <laughs> and totally. what you see in America, especially, is that it's turned into kind of like a, a wall-to-wall strip mall right? Mm. From coast to coast. And so you go to a lot of these places expecting that there will be this really intact culture and these cool hideaway diners with, you know, obviously I love crazy good food that's authentic. And what you're finding instead is, you know, Buffalo Wild Wings in Arizona or whatever. So you go to Buffalo and what are you going to do? Go to Buffalo Wild Wings. It's ridiculous. But anyway, yeah. So we kind of experience lots of different cultures within America and also internationally. And what we decided before we have kids is that we want to live in a place that is totally kind of off the grid and and different. And this is kind of like the calm before the storm, I'm feeling. And if you squint at night, you can see one light way in the distance and the rest is just, you know, owls, rattlesnakes, wild turkeys and boars and stuff. It's great out here. I freaking love it. For anyone who's watching the video, and uh, by the way, we, I, I also put the video up on YouTube and, and well.org. Um, the dude looks great. Like, I, Abel, I haven't seen you in a while, and you're just like, you're glowing. So wh- whatever, whatever kind of uh, uh, prana you're drinking from those mountains is definitely, uh, you know, you're sucking it into your skin and your pores, and your, eye, your eyes got it. So um, I got to say, I'm a little jealous right now. You, <laughs> you're, li- you're living up in the sticks, and that, that's, it's, it suits you. You have an open invitation. Yeah, and talk about the sticks, man. Uh, I, I grew up in the sticks, so I'm kind of used to it, but you have to drive an hour out of a s- small-ish Nowheresville town, and then uh, after a half an hour, you pass Hillbilly Road. Then you drive <laughs> half an hour past that, and you'll eventually find us. That's amazing. It's actually called Hillbilly Road? It's actually, yeah, it's like spray-painted on, <laughs> on, I think it's like an old piece of a house or something like that. It's like this, this board that's out in front of the road. And it says, Hillbilly Road! Oh, you my God. You just got to keep going like 35 minutes past there. You know, the, the stranger than fiction comes to mind in all of it, right? Like, it's just, it's <laughs> so good. So, I, dude, I know you're uh, an awesome, talented musician. You kind of followed some of your musical twangs to get out there and hang out with Denny, who is an awesome guy. I love that guy. Beautiful. Uh, uh, yeah, he's a beautiful man. Like just, just him and his wife. Like we we spent some time together um, at a retreat. We all went to in a mountain, and like they were the most stable, calm, like look you in the eyes and nod and mean it type of people. You know, I grew up in California where everyone's nice, but you don't know what they're thinking. You knew right. these guys were just pure. <laughs> <laughs> they're so pure. Yeah. Yeah. So what's up with the music thing? I know. Yeah, you know, I know you're a rebel, and I know you like to kick the shit out of things. And so now you're looking at music in a, in a way where you're trying to democratize it and kind of help, help your fellow musicians out. I'd love to hear where you're at with it. 
Yeah, so it was it was super cool to walk into the studio with with Denny and a bunch of the guys who normally tour with the Tim McGraw band, which is you know a big outfit and a big to do, um, and also kind of an old media system, right, of doing things. They've been doing it the same way for decades. I mean, obviously it, it evolves um, to an extent, but for people like us, we basically live on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. We've, we've created our platforms, you and I, I mean, and a lot of other people who are into podcasting and new media, YouTube and that sort of thing. We really live in that space. And so walking into the studio with those guys and saying, yeah, we, we're not necessarily going to go on tour with this project and we're probably not going to hook up with a publisher or anything like that either. We're just going to get art out there in a democratic mm-hmm. way and let it speak for itself. And that was something that, you know, for, for career musicians, there's nothing better than just playing for fun, which mm. almost never happens. <laughs> right? well, yeah, let's talk about that real quick, because, look, at the end of the day, if you're going to play music and, like, actually have that butter your bread, um, uh, and the butter part, I'm sure you agree with the bread part, you don't. But, you know, if, 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 if you're, if you're going to make a living playing music, now all of a sudden you're in that game, right? And it's a bit of a shit yeah. show, and, you, you know, now it's a job job, and, and, and I know a lot of people that become bitter about it. So then how, how does one go about doing that, right? Like, it's just, that's, I think, where a lot of people get stuck. It's like you do it for the love of music, and then all of a sudden it's like you need a Toyota commercial or you need some sort of jingle or, or, or some daddy. You know what I mean? It just, it sucks that way. For sure. Yeah, the starving artist thing applies to more than just artists. <laughs> um, and, and actually, you know, a little bit of backstory. I had before Fat Burning Man, my podcast and that whole like online health thing that I started, I was um, a musician, a, a professional musician. I also had a day job because I realized that it was far too difficult to try to pay the rent and do all the other things with just music. But I had played over 250 shows in the past year and really burnt myself out in a lot of ways because (laughs) one of the things you realize is that um, it's not always about showing off true art or true talent and putting it right out there for everyone. Uh, sometimes it's it's about pandering and it's about mm. you know like playing that song playing free bird right as the case <laughs> may be and, and those it, i mean i would i didn't actually play free bird except for right. that time that i played with a biker band that was a lot of fun but the <laughs> the point is that generally speaking the art is something that's that's almost for you it's a luxury right mm. And other people want to be entertained. So there's a lot of dance monkey dance going on mm. if you want to make the big bucks, if you want the big gigs. Uh, and even then, it's, it's definitely difficult to do in a stretch. But so I, I burnt myself out. And then I had always used music as, as kind of an emotional crutch. It was the thing that when, uh, when someone really close to me died in my teens, I couldn't cry. I couldn't release those emotions. And so for me, music was the thing that allowed all of that to come out. It was a way to therapeutically deal with whatever was going on. It's always been that. But then uh, after I burned myself out, the love was kind of gone. You abuse it if you try to get money out of it, right? That interchange Mm -hmm. can kind of poison whatever you believed in, whatever the passion was there. And I've seen that happen to so many different people, not just in music, but also, you know, for Fat Burning Man for my podcast, you know, this ridiculous thing that I started up because I got burned by following traditional Western medicine and mm-hmm. I got fat and sick in my early 20s and was sentenced to a life of popping pills like so many other people. I started up the show to make sure that that didn't have to happen to other people. I wanted this to be something where we kind of democratize health. But then all of a sudden, if I'm going to do that well and if I'm going to do it full time and if I'm going to get other people involved and have a team that really makes it possible to do high quality stuff, you need to pay rent. And mm-hmm. that's and payroll, the same problem, right? Or payroll. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the biggest thing is, is that keeps me up at night is not just, you know, uh, making sure that we can pay rent, but also the payroll and the team that we're trying to build to do good work. It's hard to do good, authentic work and make money at the same time. I, I'll stand behind that statement. You have to be way better, way more creative, or try work way harder than a lot of other people who are cutting corners. So this is a theme I, I really want to kind of hit on now, um, kind of selfishly, because it's something I've been tripping on for a while, and it's you know, it's kind of a, a major underlying theme of, of, of my new book. And I've just been, 
You know, I realized that there's a huge distinction, um, especially here in the West, between the ascetic and the householder, where, you know, in Asia, what happens is if you're going to be an ascetic, you renounce your life, you kind of like, you, no sex, no money, no nothing, I'm now a monk and I'm going to like meditate for the rest of my life and that's cool and it's, 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 a, it's a very hard life, but it's also a luxury to be able to sit around and ponder, you know, your navel or God the whole time. And then here in the West, uh, we're householders, like we got bills, we got payroll, we got all that stuff. Right, and we, however, cross over trying to get into ascetic price. Like I'm guilty. I feel so guilty. I didn't make it to yoga. It was so, you know, so such a stressful day. I wish I had time to meditate. You know, all I want to do is sit there and play guitar. But I got this idiot job at the car company, and, and so we're kind of straddling these worlds. And as an ascetic, I want to kind of lump in and say, like, the musician, the muse, the artist, someone who's like devoted their life to this craft, and yet we got bills, right? And and yeah. we got it somehow function and like be who we are and like thank god I'm, I'm happy you do the fat burning man i love your show i love your message you've helped a lot of people right but thank with you. that comes the entire headache of having to run an operation and do all that stuff and have to think about money so i i don't know i mean like just what are your thoughts on how we can find balance in that, you know, just staying pure to our, our message and at the same time kind of ethically, you know, raising enough money to, to kind of make this thing go and, and do better than just go, right? Like, I think it should right. thrive. I think you should be able to support charities all over the world with what you do. Yeah. Well, that, that's the bizarre thing, right, is that uh, when you go into this, <laughs> especially you reach a certain level, you realize you're competing with the marketing arm of giant companies, usually in supplements or gadgets or technology or whatever. And, and basically, the, the thing that you're putting your craft into, for example, the podcast, or if you have a YouTube channel, or if you're doing social media and you believe in something, you're competing with a, a lot of the noise is coming from the machine, right? And so uh, what, one of the ironic pieces that I've found is that I've always wanted to, to have a high level of production, because I think people on the other end deserve and expect that at this point. Um, but that means the harder I work and the more content I put out there, the more it actually costs me. So how do you monetize that? And, and that, so that model becomes problematic because I see a lot of people, I, I've seen a lot of people actually in the past year or so around me who I kind of came up with completely burn out or completely sell out. And hmm. so keeping that, that authenticity and not, uh, I guess you feel a little bit held back by the fact that you can't just, you know, go out there and play guitar for everyone mm. or make a podcast for everyone. You kind of need to play the game to a degree. And uh, I think it's really easy to make a bad deal. So what I like to do is, <laughs> you know that I don't really play the game that much with a lot of the <laughs> You know, affiliate stuff and the selling outside of things. So we kind of just have to outwork other people in our own way. And that's one of the advantages of living way out in the middle of nowhere. Because fortunately, you know, we do have the Internet and we live on the Internet. And then uh, we can work hard. And, and, you know, my wife, Allison, who's just so wonderful and so talented. And she's a huge reason why we've had the success we've had is because, it, it is a team. It's a collaborative effort, and we keep our costs really low. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another huge advantage of living in the middle of nowhere is that we have this wonderful place that would easily be millions of dollars in California or a lot of other places. That's twelve hundred dollars a month. <laughs> you know? right. So you you can you can live this way and continue to create really amazing things as long as you don't get tripped up by the uh, I guess materialistic aspect of a lot of our Western culture. And that's another thing that traveling around the world taught us is that we didn't want more things. When you live in a trailer that's 380 square feet, all of these trinkets and all of this shopping and ridiculousness isn't something that you want to have anything to do with. Even gifts, sometimes we would give them back to people because we're like, sorry, this literally won't fit in our living space. And there's, there's a freedom in that. So I think the overall... Um, lesson, if people are listening to, to pieces of this, and it's ongoing for me because I don't know what I'm doing, but the, the lesson that I'm learning is that it's really about what kind of life do you want? Do you want the big flashy stuff? Because that comes with a massive tax. And usually it means selling out a little bit, a little bit more than you'd planned. I love this idea of 
democratization. And so if you're living in a place where the cost of living is really low, but you think you need to go to like LA or New York to like make it big, um, I think Abel and I could both stand out there and say, you know what, the, the parasites are, are hungry <laughs> and you will, you will become a cog in a machine. And I know lots of people who've done thousands and thousands of, of books, hundreds of thousands of books or movies and stuff like that, which didn't actually see a penny. You, you had mentioned like uh, yeah. a famous quote of a, of a musician. Who I love it. Yeah, I think he sold 2.6 million CDs, never saw a cent from that. He makes money from touring. Right, right. So at the end of the day, he could have just kept touring. Uh, but, you know, arguably, you know, the, the CD sales help fill, you know, coliseums and stadiums for the guy. But yeah. the, the middlemen um, oftentimes don't bring enough to the party to justify it. But it's kind of like that Wizard of Oz thing where you think you yeah. need all these people and all these consultants Who and all these stuff. those guys? Why right? They? Yeah, they, they, they play this game. Actually, you know, it's funny is I'm going to get a little, I'll get a little heavy here is the... Um, there's a great book um, that I got you. I don't know if you read it yet. It's called Not in His Image. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's like people give me people give me so many books. I'm just like, Shh, I'll get around to it in 2018. I promise. <laughs> uh, um, and, and this this guy went through and looked at the old Gnostic gospel and mm -hmm. really started kind of peeling back on what the original Gnostic um, kind of uh, understanding of reality was before like the early Christians came in and decided it was our way or the highway and we're, you know, there's a reboot in history and it starts right now and everything be before that uh, literally gets burned in the Library of Alexandria and all this kind of stuff. But a big part of this ancient thinking that was there that I thought was fascinating was they had, their whole thing was there were these like kind of psychic beings called the Archons that are this parasitic kind of alien organism that was there that constantly worked on intermediating and getting between the flow of real creative human juice and real creative human talent. And basically they had no power on their own, but they convinced us that we needed them and they convinced us that we had to like give their power. And like, I see a lot of this stuff and I see this Archonic energy in a lot of these kind of mediated interactions in Hollywood, right? And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm doing this big thing now with Jeff Hayes and Nick Polizzi where we're, you know, we're doing our own film distribution and, and a lot of other things because we're like, what, what do these guys actually do, right? And, and so you're now having that conversation in music and you're just like, you know, The Wizard of Oz, you know, at a certain point when the gig is up, you realize how much of this whole journey has just been kind of a joke and you didn't need yeah. to do, do any of that stuff. And it's fascinating because it's uh, it's pretty much all media and, and books as well. You know that one of the reasons that I <laughs> kind of partner up with some of these big machines is to figure out how they work in some cases. And uh, a lot of times it's stacked against the little guy. It's stacked against the content creator. So one of the interesting things about partnering with a machine from time to time is you get to see how it works from the inside out. And what you learn so often is that it's stacked against the content creator to begin with. It's not uncommon for if someone writes a book for them, <laughs> if they write it, to never see a cent from selling that book. In fact, that's what happens in, in the majority of the cases. And the, uh, the business side of that has nothing to do with books. It has so much to do with selling distribution to oftentimes antiquated systems that kind of put things out that aren't art in and of themselves. And it's not the content in and of itself. It's the packaging of that content and whatever that distribution or that agent, whatever back scratching was done between all of those different organizations. That's the reason why you hear songs on the radio, why you see books in Time Magazine, why you see recommendations for movies in places even though they got six on Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, like the right. worst reviews of all time, are recommended by these, these things that should carry some sort of weight. You know, if a magazine that's well known tells you to go watch this movie and then you go and watch it and it's crap, I think that's the promise of how things are changing because mm. people are catching on to that, right? The machine is no longer working because the internet and technology has allowed it to be more of a conversation, not just between, you know, a person and an experience, but also a person and a community online and, uh, and also reviews and things like that allow you to kind of get a little bit closer to the truth as long as those reviews mm. aren't fake, which is a whole other part <laughs> of this. 
Dude, you know what's funny <laughs> is um, I have, a, I have a, um, this girl, delightful human being, who is helping us with some of our film stuff right now, who works, uh, has worked for you know, a good decade with uh, traditional film studios where they do these, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, these tests, right? Where it's just like, okay, let's get a bunch of people in this room and tell us what you love and hate about this movie. And their entire thing is to take these movies, figure out you know, what's going to spark an audience and how to sell it. And then right. she ended up having this huge breakdown because she's like, uh, you know what? This is like some horror flick. This was complete shit. It was a waste of time, energy, money, and like there's absolutely no reason any human being should see this. And they're like, yeah. okay, great. So how do we bundle it and who do we put it in front of and how do we jam? So she realized that her entire job was to take some stuff and jam the bullshit down right. people's throats and then she she had a break and she came over and she's like hey I'd like to you know work for the good guys I'm like you know welcome uh, we're you know we don't have those kinds of budgets but we don't make bullshit <laughs> right yeah. but in the, it was this entire thing like the entire industry is built on it doesn't matter if it's good what do yeah. they need to hear what can we tell them to make them believe that this is going to resolve some problem in their lives and it's right. just not it's just not real yeah well, and that's, uh, it's been that way though for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, it's only now that people are starting to understand that it's, it's crumbling a little bit. These systems are changing because they're irrelevant, fabricated, <laughs> and unnecessary. Uh, but at the same time, the internet is not a perfect place. Everything is whizzing 100,000 miles an hour and the people who get ahead there are thriving on hype in a lot of cases. Uh, thriving on things that are half truths, they're bite-sized information that are, you know, a blog post is designed to appeal to the emotions. Anyone who knows anything about marketing knows that it's an ugly, ugly game. And the things that you're psychologically trying to do to people on the other end, the people who get ahead in that game are usually sociopaths, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, the way that I see it as as content creators today is you you need to be aware of that because. Wouldn't it be beautiful if you could just, like, to go back to that earlier example, play guitar for people or put mm -hmm. out great content and let it speak for itself. You kind of need to know what you're up against and find a way to get to people anyway. And I think one of the promising things about it is once you earn the trust of somebody, it's a slow game. But once you earn that trust, a, a lot of those people are there to stay because that is so rare these days that people get actual information from people who are doing it in an authentic way that they can trust um, that they, they stick around. Because I think people are starting to catch on to the fact that most, for example, health information that people get, to get today is marketing in disguise as health information. Yep. And that's a problem because everyone's confused. So you need to just be authentic and, and let that speak for itself. And I think in some ways be content with growing slowly. You know, I was having this conversation a couple days ago about Donald Trump and why he's doing so well in these kind of like early elections. And Perfect example, Pedro. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, and, and so on our side, I'd love to hear your opinion, was like, you know, this guy's being a complete dildo, but at least he's being yeah. honest, right? And, and, you know, you and I, uh, you know, you and I have a lot of these conversations um, sure. all the time. And so the guy's actually saying someone's truth, and at least it's close enough to reality so it doesn't seem like political jargon and it's refreshing sure. and so uh, there's something to be said for that right like you don't you don't really parse your words you're just able james and that's why i think people gravitate towards you um and it's so easy to watch a political debate and just like get lulled to sleep immediately right. I've, right. I've never heard anything new you know it's the same bullshit yeah oh it's awful <laughs> but at the same time who isn't a caricature of themselves if they're standing behind a podium you know with trump is such an interesting example because i think he brings like kardashian to politics kardashian <laughs> intel to, yeah. to politics he knows how to play the game better than politicians because the game has changed you know yeah. he, he's tried to run before you can see that the things that are working now aren't the same things that would have worked back then uh and it's terrifying and fascinating but i think the lesson that a lot of people can learn from it is that you can, <laughs> you can afford to be a rebel. You can afford to go against the grain. And mm. uh, yeah, I mean, I want to be 100% honest about this. When I get behind a, a microphone or I 
am doing some sort of public appearance or something like that, you know me personally. I'm a multicolored personality. I will definitely drop some F-bombs. You get some beer in me. I sound like I'm from outside of Boston like I actually am or a frat boy or whatever, recovering frat boy. But when, when you go out, it's all about what, what do you want to bring to the world? And one of the things mm -hmm. that I've decided I want to bring is, uh, <laughs> is positivity. Mm -hmm. And someone like Donald Trump or Kim Kardashian or the, or the mega stars, that's usually not what they're bringing. Right? right. They're bringing a whole lot of other crap, too. Yeah. And uh, that's that's why it's it's so fascinating to go along for this ride, because I'm not really sure where it's going. It's it seems like everyone's going off the deep end and everything's getting faster. Uh, so that's one of the beautiful things about going out to the middle of nowhere um, and, 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 you know, designing our lives so that we could do that, right? Because a lot of people are just like, oh, that would be so nice if I could do that or whatever. We've been working for years building up so that we could do this intentionally right. um, and, and do great work here. That's one of the biggest reasons we're out in the middle of nowhere is because we want to have kids and we want to be able to afford them and build a great body of work that we can you know, continue to put out there and, and use to do good for the world and still pay rent and pay payroll or whatever else and pay for our kids lunchbox to the insides of it and all all the rest of this stuff we want to do this the right way so you have to intentionally build something yeah it, and it's a, it's a really key point because your podcast is totally like when you were on the road it was kind of like a hiatus because you were traveling so much but like your podcast is out there again right like you're yeah. you're working you are relevant you're part of the conversation uh, and you didn't drop out from society but what you've done is you've insulated yourself from a lot of the noise um, you know, and I, I got to say, like I, you know, when I was in the Himalayas, I thought I was going to stay there, and then you know, someone told me your your place is back in the world, and so here I am in the belly of the beast. You know, I got yeah. arrows flying all the time, and you've seen my life. You know, crying babies in the whole nine yards. It's like you you got to kind of keep your composure and like test you run a it circus. <laughs> yeah, I run a circus, and I think I think if I don't know if there's more than three rings in a circus, but if there are, I probably got five, and so I got a whole thing going on right and then yeah. I look at like what you're doing and I say okay great I'm gonna architect my life so that in three years I could have my kids spending at least half their year out on some land that we own where we have our own organic farms and our solar wells and all that kind of stuff so that they understand and appreciate nature while daddy right. can still do stuff over a satellite internet um, mm -hmm. but not drop out like I think the world needs Abel James doing what he does right like you know for, for the better part you know I, I you know I have a gong, I have service that I have to humanity that I, that I want to contribute. So dropping out I think is chicken shit. And um, yep. you know, like real, real men, real women, they need to step in and, and be a part of the solution. That's so true. And one of the, I, I saw this, especially the past year of traveling around and dropping out to a degree, definitely unplugging from a lot of the noise and the arrows or whatever. There was this point, and I, I, I think I talked about this on the Health Bridge, your other show, uh, where I basically declared email bankruptcy, right? And mm. I, there were thousands. There was no way I would ever be able to respond to all this stuff. I'd have to either build systems or whatever. But I realized that doing the same would not get to the point of me doing a, a better service to the world, right? It's no one is is doing the world a favor if they're burnt out and they're kind of begrudgingly going, going along with whatever is thrown at them. So mm. uh, a lot of it was an exercise in, in unplugging from that, taking some time to write my book um, and, and travel the world trying to get a little bit more perspective on how the other half lives. Right. Because if you have nothing and you're on the other side of the world, you realize that these people are just as happy, if not more happy, than, than most anyone in the West. And, uh, and you can unplug too much. You can outsource too much. And I wanted to kind of give myself the opportunity to make mistakes like that and see what would happen and learn those lessons. Because I think so many people just kind of get caught up in whatever and keep going, keep going, keep going. And I realized this is a really powerful and cool thing that... I missed the action. I missed the act of doing service. I missed really working hard for something and being passionate about it because when you unplug everything and then you're just there kind of living the ascetic life or whatever, like we were in Colorado for, for weeks, you know, we were literally carrying water and <laughs> living old school. 
uh, I felt like I didn't have a use. This is something that happens to a lot of people when they retire is yep. that, you know, you, you believed in something, you did something even begrudgingly or whatever for, for long enough, but you were good at it. You were recognized for it. You felt like you had some sort of purpose, um, to society, to the people around you. You might've been a breadwinner, breadwinner, whatever. And then all of a sudden it's just, I guess I'm going to go golf oh. or something. Like, what am I, oh, what am I doing shoot here? Me. But right. by the way, so I experienced a little bit of that. And that's one of the reasons I'm coming back with such renewed purpose because I gave myself that opportunity. I think we all kind of need to go in those cycles, but we need to give ourselves those cycles. That so you need to be intentional about it once again. Sabbatical is a real thing, right? And so you, you gained clarity from that sabbatical and came back and are of further use to society, right? You know, by the way, if, you're, so. yeah. if you're a vet, no, I, I know so, right? Like you and I go way back. Like I love what you're doing. So, you know, this, you, you, are, you are absolutely in the stream of goodness and service that is, you know, it's, it's doing good things. Uh, I just want to make a quick point. If you're a vet and you're listening to this, um, that inner warrior needs to be plugged into something, right? So this happens with retirees, and I see this a lot in vets. I've worked with a lot of vets where it's just like, you know, just bang, 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 just just like such a like a high intensity life and dedicated service to your country and all this kind of stuff. And you come back and try to live like a normal life. And, yeah. you know, you're not a normal person. You're you're an extraordinary person. And so, you know, I like, you know, um, helping people who have done that get plugged into uh, something that that is of service and is of purpose and keeps keeps yeah. you plugged in because yeah when you unplug that then that, it's just a, it's a really a quick, rainbow effect yeah to totally right <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> so, <laughs> so what what the hell is next man first of all I never get to see you so I'm just I'm kind of bummed because you live so far and I gotta just I got a baby do so I can't travel that much but you know we just got to get out in the mountains somewhere but like. What do you like? What's up on your radar? Like, what's Abel James doing now? That's that's one of the cool parts is that I find that I need to constantly reinvent myself and find new ways to to keep up with everything, right? And, and new projects to work on. And so, the doing the music piece, jamming with a bunch of rock stars, and, and putting art out there is very exciting and fun and cool because uh, it's it's just such like I was saying before, such a luxury to do art for the sake mm -hmm. of fun, you know, and just making stuff. So that's, that's one big piece reconnecting with, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I, I kind of gave up music for a while to do fat burning man because I mm -hmm. wanted to help people improve their health. And I didn't feel like I could do both at the same time, which is kind of true. You need to work your butt off to do this stuff and, and to, to do it right. Uh, and then I took time off from Fat Burning Man to write my book and do some music stuff. And now I'm kind of back with everything, trying to recalibrate and and see what it is that we want to do. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily see that we'll be living in the middle of nowhere, disconnected from society um, forever. Right. right. Um, but one of the interesting things about it is that we're not necessarily disconnected. Right. I could be anywhere right now. Right. And still look you in the eye and have a really interesting conversation. So we're also trying to explore the promise of technology. Where is that going? How can we connect with more people? Because one of the things I realized is that going around and doing speaking events and, and going on a book tour or whatever, these days is kind of irrelevant. Because every time totally. I do my, my podcast, you know, half a million downloads a month plus is ba basically like duplicating yourself so that you can affect more people. So I'm, I'm exploring how to do that more and more in <laughs> in a world where the marketers have definitely caught on to the internet and are making it harder and harder for you to do that so you know i i enjoy a good challenge and we've definitely got one right now just yep. in the fact of uh, basically trying to be as authentic as possible and put out really great stuff without crossing any lines, without selling out, without doing the stuff that everyone else always does. It's just, doesn't it get tiresome, Pedram? <laughs> what do you see? Oh, they're dropping out <sighs> blocks. Well, and, and the thing is, is like in a weak moment, you start taking advice from people who, you know, have old antiquated answers that move you into, you know, kind of dark moldy rooms of, you know, yeah. yesteryear. And yeah. so you really have to stay ethically aligned to be able to um, 
know what you want, know how you want to do it, and, and, and trust that the world, that they're, the ground that they're standing on has actually crumbled, and what they're relying on is you for their next, uh, you know, their, their next uh, kind of big payday, right? It, it, that's and that's the, the weirdest part. part. Right? Yeah. It's like, like you, all these experts you need them, you. Yeah, you're going to them for advice and they're mining you for your advice. You just, you just don't realize it at the time. But I mean, yeah, I would love to expose everybody for all of the stuff that's basically the way the world works right now, which is completely unfortunate, not writing your own books, not making your own movies, not owning your own name, uh, basically saying things that are supposed to be truth, but are basically just marketing designed to subliminally get to you and get you to buy something. I would love to do that. But at the same time, I've, I've found that I think the thing that's going to really affect people the most is finding a common ground for people who are doing good work. Cause none of it is perfect, but if you can find common ground between people who are doing at least partially the right thing, then hopefully banding together will allow you to actually upgrade the consciousness of people who are on the other end. And, and one of the things that I see, especially working in the health industry, is I have bones to pick with almost everyone. You know, I'm not going to be combative on my show. I'm not going to be combative and, and be too over the line. I don't, I don't want to be that guy. Right. But um, it's really interesting when you see some people do weird stuff who are kind of on your side because at least they're saying you can heal your body with real food compared to the traditional Western medicine system, which is way more powerful, way more deranged in a lot of ways with the drug companies. Everyone knows that story or whatever. So the people who are on the other side, at least even if they're doing weird stuff, if, if they're helping to convince people that they can heal their bodies with real food and lifestyle and, and mental, the mental side of things, the spiritual side of things like you do with Urban Monk, that is a fight worth fighting, and we need all the help we can get. Well, I'll tell you, man, um, I've been in a couple of these circles right now, um, and there's some people moving into some of the space that um, is around conscious capitalism, around health and all this, that, you know, I, you know, I don't know, if most people don't actually know my background, but, you know, I've done my fair share of exorcisms, and, like, as a Taoist priest, I've been around a lot of that stuff, and there's some dark individuals that are infiltrating some of these circles and it just mm -hmm. so like hair on the back of your neck standing up and it's just like how yeah. the hell is that person representing this movement and so right. there there has been you know this move these movements have like you know kind of gained attention and there have been um, uh, definitely like there's a direction now where there's an infiltration that is trying to happen and like things you know it's kind of like hate Ashbury was about peace and love and enlightenment in the 60s and okay. then all of a sudden everyone's on heroin and it's like wait wait something something like crack and you know things things get shifted very quickly and so if you're a good person trying to do good just know that there are are distractions out there and people out there that are interested in keeping the status quo and so you know I, I would love to hear from you what your advice would be to someone who's got like a message and wants to help the world um, what what can they do to kind of step into this this free internet and like just kind of be a, a a force into themselves for themselves? Don't sign a bad deal. Don't partner <laughs> with the wrong people. That sounds. I, I think that might sound like advice that you wouldn't normally take to heart, but there are so many. If you get a little taste of success, I mean, <laughs> I've seen your inbox, Pedram. You know what a bad deal is at this point, or at least you have some inkling. And at the beginning, if you're new to this, these people, like you're, like you're saying, that the people who are infiltrating this, that's what they do, and they are really good at it. And they've been mm -hmm. doing it for a long time. So mm -hmm. they know exactly how to get to you or get you to, at the last second, you just need to make sure, nope, that was not right. And it's okay to make mistakes. But I, I hope that uh, what... My, my body of work would show that you can do this on your own terms. That's what I mm. kind of wanted to prove to people is that I got into health because I was burned by the wrong system and I got sick and I didn't want that to happen to other people. I, I want everyone to be as healthy as possible, as energetic as possible and, and feel awesome all the time. And somehow I found a way to uh, pay our rent and a little bit of team as well in doing just that and you know there were certain things that i i don't like the way that it works right like putting scarcity around product launches and things like that or what 
what you, <laughs> for example, being shirtless all over the internet. I would much <laughs> rather have pictures of kale than me shirtless everywhere. But at the same time, you kind of have to meet the world where it is and fight fire with fire, right? Like, the, because the people who are on the other end selling the fat burning pills and doing all that weird stuff are marketers. They're not in the health space, right? right. So, so that's, that's another big piece is that you can kind of turn this on its head, I think, and basically use that against them by saying, this is how we live our lives. This is what yeah. we're eating for dinner. We didn't outsource some random person on the internet to make, you know, 400 paleo recipes or whatever. This is what we live by. And this yep. is what makes us cry at night. And yep. this is who we are. You know, so by, by doing that, it doesn't, even if you still have to keep your day job or, or find another way to make all of this work, work, at least you have that, right? And that is, that is more than they'll ever have because having known a lot of these people who are using the fake reviews, writing these fake books, putting out all of this junk or whatever, they're not sleeping well at night. Mm. They're, they're doing a bunch of drugs. They're buying a bunch of stuff and going bankrupt most of the mm -hmm. time. That's how mm -hmm. it plays out. And this, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. So being authentic and being yourself and just kind of like opening the veils on all of that and letting that speak for itself, I think is the future of this because we're not going to see these mega, mega companies that control the machine and kind of shove all this content down people's throat anymore. I think it's starting to turn it, it into these little pieces, these little niches that are based around real people doing real things. So if you're on the other end of this, do your thing. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it will, you'll, you'll experience some success, even if that's just helping one or two people along the way. That is powerful stuff. You know, there's a component to this that I've fallen in love with, and you know, I'm not shy about it, is this conscious capitalism piece, where I think the other side of that is we vote with our dollars and so every time you go buy a can of coke or you go you know buy some shit plastic made in some chinese factory at target that you know came out of some you know child labor um, you're supporting that world right? right and so if you want the world to be a better place put your money with people that are doing the right thing. And so it's like if you find, you know, and I like, like, like the Etsy model, it's like you find these little artisans that are doing great stuff and you're like, here's a hundred bucks, that's awesome, thank you, right? Yeah. And, and moving your money uh, where your mind and your heart is, I think is a big part of that. And that's where all these companies are like, freaking out and they're like buying up like you know oh this juice company did well we get it. So, so they're trying to acquire all this and they can't keep up with it because people yeah. are tired of getting these idiotic poisonous products shoved down their throat or you guys are putting too much coal out in the atmosphere so we're boycotting you and like the consumer as we wake up you know i hate that word consumer but it's kind of used yeah. in like you know our economy we are the consumers and each of us are so strong in our elected allocation of power through money that I think we forget that and I think this you know like you're talking about this on the personal scale but it just it just ripples out if we do it right to make the world better faster yeah and one of the coolest things that I've realized is that you know my strength is not selling millions of dollars of product that's not what I do right. it's influencing people and and one of the most powerful things is the the podcasters or the other people who come up to me saying that just watching someone else do it and seemingly make it work was enough for them to do it themselves and help mm. spread their message and other mm. people to, to start doing that. So I think the new economy, conscious capitalism, that's what we'll see is that there are more and more people who are affecting more people than they probably realize and helping really spread this new economy of things. Because mm. another thing that I realized, people aren't buying my stuff because of my marketing or whatever. They're buying it because they believe in what we do. Right. They're buying it because they'll, they'll come and give you money for whatever you're doing if they believe that yeah. you're doing the right thing and that it's helping people. And so that's another really important thing to notice. And, and you and I have had offline communications about how do we figure this stuff out? We're up against right. big players, right? And they, yep. they don't want us to do well. So I, what you really need to do is, is create awesome stuff for people. Mm -hmm. And they will pay a premium for your best stuff if you make it awesome. And yep. uh, it's... It's not the Maserati lifestyle, but it is a very fulfilling one. And if you go back to the luxury of being an, an, ascet, an ascetic, that's 
kind of what we're trying to bridge right now is realizing that you don't want bigger and better. You're programmed to think that you do. You always want more, especially in the Western world. It's not what you want. What you want is, is to be able to do your thing with the creative freedom to do your thing. And that's one of the most promising things about all of this is because, you know, if you were in the movies, if you were in music, if you were writing books, whatever, you did not have control over your creative message uh, until pretty much now, yeah. right? There was someone, there was that suit coming in saying, you can't say that, or I own your name, or we're cutting that. Now it's like, you can just put something on YouTube and it's there. Um, not 100%. I mean, like anyone can still censor you for whatever, but I think more than ever, you can just be like, this is my creative control and I am exercising it and I'm saying whatever the F I want. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And if, if you look at some of the sensitivities of like traditional TV, um, they might have a, a million pitches for really good content coming in. It's like, let's say, say you're ABC, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden they look, they look at the array of advertisers that are buttering their bread. And these guys are struggling. Like they're trying to make a living and they're trying to like, you know, make things work. And they're like, well, the Christians are going to hate that, and then the conservatives are going to hate that, and these people are going to hate that, and you know, so it's like you get all these wonderful ideas, and you're like, okay, we're going to make another show about home improvement because that's the only thing our advertisers are going to be down for, and then you're realizing that those shows suck because it's the same damn show over and over again. Whereas you go to some right. like some dude on the internet who's just speaking truth, um, you know, uh, Toyota isn't necessarily advertising with him, but he's right. he's telling it like it is, and it's so refreshing. Yeah. It is refreshing, and uh, there are so many examples of that. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more, and I, th I think it's going to be a, uh, a weekend warrior type thing, too. That's how mm -hmm. I started, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with this whole thing, is you just, hey, I kind of want to talk about this. I, I, I think I have an opinion. I'm not an expert or whatever, but let's, let's explore this. Let's start something and put it out there and see what people think, and, and that's another lesson in all of this. If, if you really start creating, creating something and being part of a movement, then that movement can help you create the very thing that allows you to sustain your business if you choose to make your money that way. So for me, one of the biggest reasons we've had enormous success and, you know, made a lot of revenue and income, not to buy Maseratis or whatever, but to support a bigger staff that can do cooler stuff is by building this community for free, right? Giving them a lot of free stuff that's of great value and then asking them what they need next. What yeah. do you need more of? What should I research? What can, what can I help you do? And building products around that. And, and that is such an awesome business to be in because it's a communication between, um, between real people, you know, not, not, not between the consumer and the conglomerate, but between real people. Yeah. And, and I think that's where this is going. Tell me how to help you. And, and look, I mean, the, the only thing I think I'm an expert in is being me. <laughs> the rest, <laughs> you know, the rest you of it. You are an expert in that. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing I, you know, spend a lot of time on is, is, you know, really focusing on that and not trying to be, a, you know, bullshit and just knowing my limitations. And the rest yeah. of it, I got smart friends. You know, I'll phone a friend. It's like, we're going to talk about neurology. I'll call a really smart neurologist and ask them right. um, as the voice of our audience, you know, hey, what's the answer to this and what's your opinion on that? And so you don't, like a lot of people I think feel like they're frauds because they don't think they have all the answers so they never start. But you don't yeah. have Neither to do have. the experts, by the way. <laughs> yep, totally, totally. You know, the top one percent still debate. You know, the 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 rationale of like half the science out there, and you know, there's certain things we know, and then all of a sudden, a decade later, it turns out you know that wasn't even right. So, and and not to poo-poo science. There's lots of you know, it's I, I'm a scientist. I love science, but you know, the the famous experts oftentimes are also, they also have a dog in the race, right? And so sure. if, you, if you feel like you wanna know something, just start asking people and you know, you, uh, chances are, um, are the voice of 100,000 other people that are wondering that but don't want, don't, haven't stepped out yet to kind of like do that publicly. So I, I just, I love the format, I love the freedom and I love the promise of it. And you know, you're a living example of it, as am I. I mean, what, how the hell am I a filmmaker? You know, I've done two right. great movies and I got more coming. Um, and it wasn't yeah. because I went to film school, it's because I got tired of seeing garbage films that didn't serve humanity. So I had to throw my hat in that ring. Yeah, and it's a beautiful thing. And also, you know, 
I think when you take out all of those suits, when you take out all those experts and all those other ridiculous people who somehow got involved with the process, I was talking to you about this this earlier offline. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating that just to run the the website that I have with my wife and a couple of other you know part time people who help with various things every once in a while, we're basically running a direct to market direct response newsletter of some kind, you know, like mm -hmm. a, or even like a newspaper column, depending on how you look at it, or blog, you know, those all kind of follow into those old school categories. Running a, a weekly TV show, right, or TV special or whatever, which would be this, right? We're on TV right now. People are, are watching <laughs> it either on computers or devices or, or TVs, but it's the same exact content. Uh, radio as well, right, weekly. And, uh, you know, all, all of that social media, which is multiple times a day, I, it's difficult to know how to describe whatever the heck that is advertising right. or, or content it's who knows but anyway the amount of content that you can create just by yourself rivals that of almost any huge company out there and and one of the biggest problems with these big companies is they don't really have an identity you know for example if you're a paleo company and you sell supplements it doesn't really make sense because cavemen didn't take supplements, right? And so <laughs> right. these big companies that have all of these different brands and all these different things that they're doing, they kind of fall apart in the public consciousness because what they're doing doesn't make sense. It's not authentic. It doesn't, it doesn't follow the actual story. Um, but if you work hard and you're willing to keep doing that and be consistent, then you can put out content that rivals almost any TV station out there. And no, it's not going to be like beautiful and Ford won't sponsor you or whatever. But I mean, these lights cost 80 bucks and behind me is a wall. <laughs> Which most people have. <laughs> Which most people have. You can make this stuff. And I, I think that's really freaking cool. Yeah, there's a piece to that too where I think there's um, a part of this freemium economy. And we're running out of time, but you and I can do this for days and we have. We've hung out for weeks yeah. on end. Um, yeah. the, a part of this freemium economy that's made it a bit more challenging where, you know, there's a lot of things that are free. And so people who are doing shows and content then, you know, fall into that and then feel like, oh my God, now I got a hawk product so that I can make a living at this because all my front facing stuff is free. And I think, you know, I, when I like someone's message, I might not even have time to read their book, but I buy their book right? Mm -hmm. To support the fact that they're moving the conversation forward. And so I think as a consumer, it's kind of trained me to elect with my money how to support people that I like, um, just to kind of vote for them, give them a little shot in the arm. And so like mm -hmm. I pay a lot more for information now than I do for stuff. I got enough stuff. I got, you know, like what, right. do we get a storage bin once the garage fills up? You know, it's just, we all have enough stuff. And if you eat right, you probably need less supplements. And so all of that stuff is a bit of a trap because the market needs you to consume. And as we move out of this consumer economy into this new economy of just people liking each other and supporting each other, then part of that to me is like, I'd love to help pay your rent, right? Because I love what you're doing and I enjoy your show. So however I can support Abel, I will. Um, because my money is gonna go somewhere, right? And it shouldn't go yeah. to whoever. I mean, I'm not gonna, like Monsanto, right? Yeah. I don't want them to have my money. <laughs> Right. And, and that's the interesting thing, too, because I think, you know, it's not like you can't have a paleo get back to being human brand that sells something or, or pushes a product that is a supplement or whatever. I think the, the biggest problem right now is that these big companies are trying to come in. They're turning something like paleo into a fad because it doesn't make sense when big companies are, are spouting this this crap out. So, yeah, you need to. You also need to ask for the sale. Right. If you're on the other end of this, you are the, the person who's creating the content. People will come to support you if you simply ask for the sale in the right way. And some of that is knowing something about marketing and, you know, doing event based uh, event based things like launching a movie or like doing something for a specific amount of time. Like we do online classes or whatever to get people involved. And we do it for specific times. So there are ways around all of this where you can do it in kind of like a cool authentic way you just need to be creative that's it and and don't be shy i think that the um money is evil kind of 
mentality that's permeated a lot of kind of uh, more progressive thinkers has also kept us from being able to support um, a worldview that we would like to bolster. So the people that, the, the sociopaths all go run after money and the rest of us just don't want to think about it. And mm -hmm. I, I like, I like my influential friends to be as rich as they can be because then they donate to a better world they support other things and they buy retreat centers that i go visit you know what i mean and so yeah. i i think that's a that's a it's a separate conversation maybe we'll just have you back on and talk about this but like you know i think money is evil is something that has really kind of is a critically flawed meme that has infected um, the well-intentioned people of the world's minds, and that's something we need to fundamentally rethink. And I want yeah. I want good people to be wealthy and and just influential and in moving things around, and not buying Maseratis. Who cares about the Maserati? It sucks. Right. <laughs> well, I think money is changing. I think there's a very interesting thing that happens psychologically when you no longer have to handle a physical thing, and so. For me, I haven't, I, the only time I really think about money is the farmer's market because that's, that's the only time I really exchange cash totally. for any goods anymore. And I do it very happily at the, at the farmer's market or whatever. But money is starting to be, what, what is wealth if it's just, you know, <laughs> I've told this story before. But I went internationally and you go to the ATM and I had over a billion in the currency and realized that it's all a fantastic illusion. Totally. All of this stuff is ridiculous because, you know, some currencies are inflated, other ones are not. And all of it is just kind of like ones and zeros on a computer anyway at this point. So true wealth is something very different from any of that. And I think one of the things that can make you feel the most wealthy has nothing to do with anything material or, or wealth at all, but has to do with the, the power of a message that you believe in and the vehicle to spread it which is now available to pretty much everyone who has a phone. <laughs> totally. You're connected into it. All you need to do is stop being shy and engage in the, the, the platforms that can get your message out to millions and millions of people right now. That's right. Love it. Right now. Hey, Right now, right now. I mean, literally, you could periscope it, and, and like right now, right now, be live with the world. First time mm -hmm. I periscoped, I just like my, my wife told me something about like how because in California we have no water, so there's this fad of lawn painting, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, well, these companies come and they paint your lawn green so it doesn't look as shitty. And I was like, so I ran out, hit periscope for the first time, and I was like, here's my response to lawn painting, and I just showed my garden. And how we're growing food and my kids like in there getting dirty and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, it was my, literally my first time. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's 73 people here right now. Yeah. And, and they're like, oh, I love it, I love it. I'm getting all these hearts. And I sit there and think to myself, okay, this is changing reality. I literally had a thought, something that, that made me, you know, sparked me to say this is bullshit. Like, why would people paint their, the earth, the last thing the earth needs is more toxic chemicals sprayed on her right now, right? And, and so all of a sudden, 73 people jumped in and they were like, yeah, cool. And they sparked to it. They don't know who, who I am. I don't have like a, a Periscope presence yet, right? Yeah. And, and so that's available now. Right, all that so anyone could podcast right now. So, Abel, man, I we could go on forever. Um, I just I love you. I love what you're doing, and selfishly, I want our kids to grow up together. So we're gonna have to figure out how to live closer at, at a certain point. Um, but for the time being, we got we got Skype and we got this. Tell people how they could find you, um, and uh, y'all listening. Just you know, obviously, you know, this, you see why I love this guy. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, you can find me. My name is Abel James. Uh, quick Google will pull up all sorts of crazy stuff, but easiest ways to find me are uh, by going to fatburningman.com. That's where you can find delicious recipes and most of the health stuff. That's also the name of uh, my podcast, so check that out on iTunes. And abeljames.com will have some of my music stuff coming up here soon. Yes, and he's a hell of a musician, so I can't wait till you share that Thanks, with the man. world. All right, brother. Great to see you as always, and uh, till next time. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for listening. Hey, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Abel James. Uh, like I said, love that guy. And uh, there's more of this to come. I'd love to hear from you. 
how you like the vibe and the flow of this show. Uh, you know, I'm going pretty free form here, trying to really engage in conversations that are uh, relevant and um, I miss, you know, I just miss authentic conversations about stuff that matter and so that's why I stopped watching TV. And so this is the new TV, you know, we're here to serve you. Uh, Abel's awesome. I, I, invite you to check out his stuff. Also, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, if you're on YouTube, subscribe as a, as a YouTube person in iTunes or Stitcher, or wherever you're at, please subscribe. That helps me know, uh, you know that you're loving it up and that you are on board. Also, give me comments, right? Reviews matter. I wanna see how I can serve you and it's a two-way street, right? This isn't traditional TV where I'm just gonna blast and then uh, hope you loved it, right? Let us know and let my team know, because I read all that stuff, um, what you thought of the show and who you'd like for me to interview and, and where I can take this with you, because this is our show and uh, let's do it together. I'll see you in the next one.